I yes, yes, <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good, thanks you. Good, I'm good. I'm good. Hi, Hi there, everybody. Live rookie. We'll just start with a video and then I'll hand over to you. Our family and friends are a big part of who we are. They are our biggest supporters and confidence, and a source of belly fulls of love. And when it comes to keeping you connected, Western Union is here to make it safer and easier with their digital services. Now your family and friends overseas can send you money without leaving home by using the Western Union app. Western Union. Just gkmsonline.com to register and share your banking details with your sender to start receiving funds directly to your bank account so you don't have to leave home to collect. Grace Kennedy Money Services, home of Bill Express, FX Trader, and Western Union, doing our part to help you stay safe and connected to the ones you love. Over to you, Ricky. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ruki Wilson. I am the chair of the Jamaican Diaspora Task Force Action Network, Citizen Security and Safety Task Force. Welcome to our Diaspora Day panel entitled Citizen Security and Safety, Partnering to Keep Our Citizens Safe. This is an opportunity to hear from Jamaica regarding citizen security and safety and how the diaspora can be engaged to partner with Jamaica to help keep our citizens safe. Let me introduce our esteemed panelists for this evening. Just a note, this will be a brief introduction. The panelist bio with more details will be on diasporaday.jd10.org website. I'd like to welcome Brigadier Roderick Williams, OD, JP. Brigadier Williams is currently double-hatted as a national coordinator for Plan Secure Jamaica in the Office of the National Security Advisor, ONSA, and the Commander of the Maritime Air and Cyber Command of the Jamaican Defense Force, the JDF. Welcome, Brigadier. I'd like to welcome Inspector Natalie Palmer. Inspector Palmer is a member of the Jamaican Constabulary Force for 23 years, she works at the Community Safety and Security Branch and is currently the Staff Officer to the Assistant Commissioner of Police. Welcome, Inspector. Then we have Professor, ha Professor Hamilton. She is the CEO of the Lasco Chin Foundation, former Vice President at the University of Technology, Jamaica, and was awarded Professorship in Entrepreneurship and Development. She's also the chair of the newly created Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance. Thanks for having me. Now, thank you. Now we have Mr. DeWitt Jeffrey, JP. Mr. Jeffrey is a guidance counselor at the Stony Hill Technical High School, a justice of the peace, leader of the founder of the True Heroes Under God Thug Ministries, president of the Gold Street Police Youth Club, and president of Area 4 Police Youth Club Council Executive and a radio host at Power 106. Welcome, Mr. Jeffrey. Now we have Ms. Renee Steele. She's a senior policy director with responsibility for the crime prevention and community safety branch at the Ministry of National Security in Jamaica. Welcome, Ms. Steele. Then we have Mr. Charles Clayton. Mr. Clayton is a program director for the Community Renewal Program, CRP, which is an initiative with the Planning Institute of Jamaica, PIOJ. He has had over under, just under 40 years professional experience working among the public sector, the international development community, and the private sector. Welcome, Mr. Clayton. To also welcome Mr. Kevin Junior. He's a decorated veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces Reserve. He is the International Liaison Officer for the Jamaican Combined Cabinet Forces, the JCF, and a member of the Global Jamaican Diaspora Council. Welcome, Mr. Junior. 
Thank you very much. I will also like to welcome Norman O. Hemmen III. He's a chief federal administrative law judge who oversees Title II and Title 16 cases under the Social Security Act. Previously, Mr. Hemmen served as special counsel to the United States Attorney with the US Department of Justice. And he is serving on the Alumni Association Board of Directors for Jamaica College. Welcome, Judge Hemmen. Thank you all for being here. So we will start today. I just want to remind you more um, detailed bios are on diasporaday.jdtan.org. Thank you for all. Thank you for one of our to one of our sponsors, Jamaicans.com, which we are now currently streaming live on Facebook. Now we will start with Brigadier Williams, who will share the citizen security plan. Brigadier. Thank you very much, Ruki. Just a minute to get my screen up. Right. Um, come from your see my screen. Yes. Okay, so I'll assume you're seeing and hearing me. So, so good night all, um, and happy diaspora day to those of you who are members of diaspora. Uh, today or tonight, uh, my aim is to provide a synopsis of Jamaica's citizen security plan and to suggest ways that the diaspora can contribute to the outcomes that we are seeking. The outline I'll follow during this brief presentation um, is essentially to give you a brief overview of the plan uh, followed by a few suggestions uh, for continued diaspora engagement. So I start quickly by just highlighting the goals and end state that we are pursuing. So the goal of the plan is to improve citizen security in Jamaica. Uh, that's the goal. And what we're working towards, of course, um, is a safe, secure, cohesive, and just society. Um, and this plan that I'm going to describe to you briefly was developed through a multi-sectoral -sect consultative process. And so I get straight into the, the meat of the matter, starting with, of course, with the policy and strategy framework for the plan. So the first thing I want to point out is that the security, the, the security, the city security plan for Jamaica is a thematic component of Plan Secure Jamaica. Now, Plan Secure Jamaica, as you can see behind me, it is a comprehensive, coordinated, integrated, flexible, inclusive, and enduring approach to delivering the developmental goal of a more safe, secure, cohesive, and just society. It is that plan that now targets the long-standing challenges that we have had uh, by effectively employing proven evidence-based, inclusive and sustainable approaches in addressing the many and varied threats to Jamaica, Jamaica's security in what we have discovered or what we're now discovering is a very dynamic global environment. And of course, these threats include uh, environmental hazards that include sort of health hazards we're talking about here with COVID, of course, crime, uh, corruption, uh, and injustice, and of course, all their drivers and root causes. So from that, you could, you could understand that Jamaica necessarily treats the concept of national security in broad, people-centered, human security terms. So consequently, Plan Secure Jamaica prioritize improvement in citizen security as the single most important developmental reform that Jamaica is undertaking at the moment. And so significant focus has been placed on promoting and pursuing those measures that will nurture, strengthen and protect democratic civic order, prevent and or reduce crime and violence, ensure compliance with rules and the setting of other conditions that will allow for a secure, cohesive, and peaceful coexistence among our citizens. 
In pursuing the measures outlined, all agents of the state will continue to be held accountable in accordance with the rule of law. Uh, they be required to demonstrate respect for the human rights and dignity of our citizens and operate legitimately with discipline and integrity in countering all the threats I have alluded to before. Um, and all these threats, of course, um, uh, um, challenge our public safety environment, national security, and of course, um, national development itself. Uh, the only thing I want to point out then is that um, on its own, the citizen security plan does not aim to address all the possible threats to citizen security and safety. I mean, it's not a silver bullet, but instead it works in tandem with or through other components of the broader Plan Secure Jamaica. And other thematic components or areas of Plan Secure Jamaica include cyber security, um, maritime security, border security, uh, critical national infrastructure security, uh, and things like communications for social and behavior change, et cetera. So with that said, let me talk about the, the, the outcomes that we're trying to achieve with this particular plan. And here you see the three prioritized outcomes. Um, I hope you all can read that. Um, but for those who can't, the, the, the first prioritized outcome there is crime and violence reduction. So no surprises there. Uh, the second one is um, to create safer spaces. And here we're talking about uh, reducing opportunities for crime and violence that could arise from situational factors. And then finally, uh, and some would say probably most importantly, um, is human and community development. And here we are talking about activities geared at transforming lives and communities. So what I want to talk about next are the key attributes of this plan. Um, when you see it in action, uh, what are the features? And, and so uh, this list here is self-explanatory. Um, uh, what I want to highlight is that at bullet two, uh, that speaks to setting the conditions for significant behavior change and the transformation of communities uh, to include the provision of more life chances for at-risk youth. Um, and so I want to move quickly to talk about the approach that the plan takes to citizen security. And I do so by, by illustration. Um, and so if you look to this chart, um, what I want to highlight is that the core approach that the plan takes to citizen security is that it emphasizes or, or, or a lot of emphasis is placed on prioritizing the most vulnerable and at risk among us. That is to say, prioritizing the most vulnerable individuals and communities for focused intervention. And we expect that this will give us the, the biggest uh, bang for the buck. Now, using murders and shootings as a proxy for the level of vulnerability, the image here shows the location, uh, locations of the top 50 vulnerable communities for the 33 month period indicated. And the relative situation is more or less uh, the same today. Now, if we go quickly orient you to the, to the, to the diagram, the, uh, if you look to the legend at the bottom, the black lines on the map represent the police divisions which for the most part correspond to the parish boundaries, except of course for St. Catherine that is divided in two, you can see there north and south. Um, St. Andrew, um, that has three, I think St. Andrew Central, St. Andrew South um, um, are, are among them. And then Kingston with another three, West, East and, and Central for a total of about 19 uh, police divisions. And the colored areas represent the most vulnerable communities in those police divisions and range from light to dark, where the darker the area, the higher the number of murders and shootings recorded. Now, as you can see, the police divisions with the higher incidence of murders and shootings are in St. James, Westmoreland, Clarendon, Kingston, We lost the volume. Brigadier. We're back. 
Yeah, thank you. So let me just quickly share again. Yeah. Voila. So I, I hope I, I lost I lost repeat uh, my my attempt to orient you to the diagram. I think I I would have gotten as far as to describe to you what the colored areas mean. And um, I was going on to point out that these 50 communities experience about 44% of the total number of murders and shootings in Jamaica on average over the last five years. And that the vast majority of those are due to gang and criminal activity. So <laughs> if this is the face that Jamaica is presenting to the world, then the affected areas would be like pimples of varying sizes and severity. And so the essence of the plan's approach, therefore, is to comprehensively treat with each pimple, if you will, while simultaneously treating the entire face so that no new pimples pop up. So as alluded to before, and again, just now with that analogy, um, the fundamental approach of the plan is to target interventions and therefore our limited resources where the problems are, and in doing so, to focus on stemming the bloodshed, that is to say, saving lives, whilst treating with the root causes for more sustainable outcomes. So if I could move on quickly, um, this overlay shows the areas where states of public emergency have been declared and are still in effect today. The most recent of these be the declaration two days ago uh, covering Kingston West, the Kingston West and Kingston Central Police Divisions. So as you can see, unsurprisingly, there is a correlation between where the states of public uh, emergencies have been declared and the police divisions with the highest number of murders and shootings. So while states of public emergency are not part of this, 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 this the, the plan per se, the security plan per se, I decided to share this fact with you because I thought you'd find it interesting, but because uh, it also illustrates the complementary nature of the broader security measures and considerations. Um, I want to point out as well that um, these states of, of, of of emergency um, are usually declared instances where the situation is beyond the scope of normal policing actions. And the key utility it delivers, of course, is that it helps to more effectively um, separate uh, uh, perpetrators, uh, uh, perpetrators of victims where we have these, you know, this, these areas of rampant criminality and violent crime. And of course, it allows for more flexibility and therefore greater effectiveness and efficiency in the use of the limited number of security forces personnel available given the scale uh, of the violence epidemic, epidemic in Jamaica. So uh, moving on quickly, um, the, 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 the sort of uh, root or core of the approach of the plan is centered around the, the clear whole bill strategy. And that provides an important supporting framework for delivering improved citizen security in the most vulnerable communities, as you could well imagine. Um, I don't think I need to go through and describe to you uh, in detail the nature, as Jamaicans, the nature of some of these communities we're talking about and the situation that is there. Uh, but you can appreciate the need to clear and hold, and of course, subsequently build these communities. Uh, so to that end, areas are selected for intervention from a continually updated list of the country's top 20 at-risk communities using uh, this clear whole build approach um, and the criteria legislated in the ZOSO Act. And I talk about ZOSO some more momentarily. Um, so the plan itself is particularly geared, you'll see, in the hold and build phases to support improvements in police effectiveness through uh, pub well, problem-oriented and community policing, uh, offender management and rehabilitation, as well as supporting the creation of safer spaces, as well as human and community development, all of, all of which uh, you know, converge 
on the aim of transforming lives and communities. And all of this, of course, is being delivered through the broader supportive framework of Plan Secure Jamaica. Uh, and so a bit about the criteria for, for selecting these committees for intervention. Um, so the law reform zones of special operations, special security and community development measures act 2017 um, make pro makes provisions uh, you know, for short Zoso um, makes provisions for for areas to be declared as a zone of special operation it, uh, operations if they meet the criteria indicated um, there on the screen. And so the objective of the act is to provide special measures for upholding and preserving the rule of law, public order, citizen security and public safety within certain geographical areas using the clearhold build strategy. And this of course is, 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 has a check and balance of, of, of you know, um, parliament having to approve the, the extension of a particular zone for a period not exceeding 60 days in each instance. And so the approach to security in Jamaica is therefore aligned to the object and intention of the act, which is used as a guiding principle in the selection of communities and areas for interve intervention. So basically, um, you know, where, where there's the most risk to our population, where, where there's the greatest level of bloodshed, um, um, those are the citizens that we're going to prioritize for protection um, from the state. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about, um, uh, but not the final thing, penultimate thing, um, is the governance framework. Because with, with all of this, we have to ensure that we have a robust uh, governance uh, framework in place um, to see to it that what needs to get what needs to get done gets done, and and it get done it, it gets done uh, 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 properly, of course, in conformance with all our laws and regulations. And so, from the bottom up, you'll see that the plan itself has two. Uh, basic mechanisms. The, the first one is the operational mechanism that, that sort of details what needs to be done and who needs to do it in terms of which ministry department or agency or entity um, needs to get on with a particular activity. Um, on the other side, there's a monitoring evaluation and learning mechanism that treats with, um, you know, uh, performance. What do we need to be measuring, tracking and monitoring to ensure that we are, uh, we are doing the right things um, um, and, and be able to, to, to learn so we can test and adjust and, and, and make sure the plan is flexible to the changing and mutable circumstances. Uh, above that, you begin to see other elements of the framework. Um, on the far left here, you see the city security secretariat um, that is resourced by the Ministry of National Security and they are responsible for coordinating the implementation of the plan. And so they'll drive the operational mechanism. Um, uh, to, the, to, the, to the left of that, right, depending on how you look at your screen, um, is, a, is the business group. And they are constituted by the, uh, this, this is a, a cross-sectoral, cross you know, um, whole of government rep representative organization that, that has on it the administrative heads and other heads of entities. Um, and they sit there and they, are, and they drive the monitoring and evaluation and learning mechanism. So they are the ones who will be doing that check to ensure that performance is going according to plan. So we're doing what we're supposed to do into the standard within the time frame, And they are able, when they are tracking those things, to be able to take decisions to keep things on track if it's within their gift to do. And if it's not, it will inform policy recommendations they make to the other oversight mechanism um, that they report to, which is the National Security Council. Um, they also provide reports, you know, the raw reports of how performance is going um, to an independent oversight entity um, called the Citizen Security Oversight Committee. And that's going to be made up um, or almost epoch style of, of wide stakeholder um, representation. So academia, uh, civil society entities, um, et cetera. Uh, the private sector all will be represented here and of course the other ones are, are very clear to you but the one i want to highlight here is the violence prevention commission their role essentially is to conduct research that will inform um security policy um, so they'll advise the nsc 
And of course, cabinet provides oversight, the wider cabinet. Um, as you know, NSC is essentially a subset of cabinet, um, also chaired by the prime minister. And then from an oversight standpoint, the relevant committees and commissions of parliament will provide the usual oversight. And then parliament itself, um, you know, in respect to the, the various acts is also being one um, um, states of public emergency, if you want to look at that as a broader complementary activity, Parliament has a role in all of that as a check and balance. Um, so that's the governance framework. So fairly robust um, and high level. Um, and and I, I think matching the nature of the uh, or the severity uh, or importance of the problem that it's it's a, it's it's geared at addressing. And so and so finally now. Um, uh, how can the diaspora contribute? Um, so through mentorship, volunteerism, and the provision of resources, the diaspora can contribute to the plan in the six broad ways indicated here. Uh, and so the first one, if you allow me to read, um, um, is geared at strengthening and broadening uh, um, continued direct support to implementing agencies in carrying out their mandate. Um, Second is strengthening support to social interventions aimed at reducing social vulnerability to violence and crime, particularly in at-risk communities. And third, continue to strengthen the mechanisms for coordinating the efforts of the diaspora in its contribution to citizen security. At fourth, enhance the capacity of legitimate community-based organizations to participate in the planning and implementation of interventions geared at developing their communities, because that's a problem uh, that could use all the help it could get. And then fifth, strengthen support to diversion strategies and initiatives aimed at placing at-risk youth on a path away from the criminal justice system. And finally, of course, greater focus on, initi on initiatives geared at enhancing the involvement of women in community peace and security. Um, I'm happy to, to clarify further um, in the Q&A session, but in the interest of time, I will, I will stop talking here. Thank you, Brigadier Williams, for that well-organized and detailed presentation. Now we will, now we will hear from Inspector Natalie Palmer, who will share about the JCF regarding community interaction and community safety. Hi, good night, everyone. All right, so talking about community interaction, and from a Jamaica Constabulary Force um, perspective, we are talking about community based policing. Uh, depending on who you're talking to, they'll tell you that it started from the inception, so we'll tell you that it was from in the 60s or the 70s. But um, the formalized version has been around over 20, 20 years now. And why are we doing it? Would have realized that operations alone cannot work. It cannot solve our crime problems. So we have taken on this aspect where we're saying that we need the support of other persons. Um, crime is everybody's business. So we definitely need the support of everybody, all stakeholders. Uh, would have gone into communities, and you know, sometimes we go in with these preconceived notions that a community needs X. Uh, but when you get there, they're telling that, that this is not what we want, um, or it may be something that they want, but it is not the number one priority at the time. So community-based policing allows us now to go in and we're saying what it is that you are not working together now. Uh, how are we going to solve the problem of crime? What is your priority? Um, social disorder, all these things that we have to take into consideration without going in with the preconceived notion. What it does is that it allows persons to know the police. We talk about proximity policing. Uh, who is working in your community? I see Roderick give out a nice details of our division, policing division, uh, the trouble spots and all of that. It is good to know who are the police that are working in your area which is that we can call on our stakeholders, our partners. Um, it provides a personalized approach as well. You know me, I know you. Um, you're familiar, you're, you're, you're comfortable. So what it does is that it is more easy for us to get information. We're on the ground. Uh, we would have built that level of trust and our persons will confide in us. So we have been going um, that route. 
what it allows us to do is that we would have identified persons who we call violence producers. You know, we look at potential witnesses. We look at children, unattached young persons, how it is that we can help. Uh, we, we're talking about policing, but we would have seen for the most part that a lot of the activities that we do within communities, it's not centered around policing. Um, persons will tell us that we're doing social work from time to time. And uh, it may be that we're doing some aspect of that, yes. But if we don't take it on, then we're going to find that our crime challenges are way more. So we'll be going in and we're doing our, our summer camps. Uh, we have this lovely one that we, we call our iPad summer camp. We'd have been engaging citizens through sporting competitions. We talk about football, netball, um, the whole gamut of that, um, including dominoes. So we'd have been seeing some kind of results. Uh, when we look at the table, we are seeing that there are four possible interventions to any incident of crime that we can look at. We're talking about the operational aspect. We're talking about intelligence, um, investigative, and of course, community safety and security aspects. And we look, if I'm going to take out two main um, points, we're talking about crime, um, gang violence, and murder. When you look at the input of community safety, we have seen that our intervention amounts to 35%. So when you add up everything, those four areas, our, um, our input ad adds up to 35%. If you're talking about domestic violence, it goes way more, where that now takes us to 65%. And these are the two main areas that we are having challenges with, reprisal, gang murders, domestic violence. Um, and those two come, contribute to about 80% of our crime, violence, crime and violence that we're having in Jamaica. Uh, we have too many unattached youth, and that is a reality. Uh, we have unemployed youth, we have those who are unemployable, we have persons who lack um, education, the qualifications to get a job, that's a whole host of stuff. But when we go into these communities, we are able to identify um, what it is that is needed. And I'm looking and I'm seeing some of our stakeholders um, on screen as well, would have been trying our best. So we're talking about partnership, that is one aspect of community-based policing. And we look and we say how it is, what it is that we can do. What is the solution? And I've said before, it is not a crime, a JCF only problem. You know, it is everybody's business. So we would have gone in, um, and for the most part, it's not just JCF that has gone in. So I'm talking about our intervention activities. You'll see that we have partners at the Rene on, on, on screen. We would have other persons who are actually there at the Charles as well, um, Roger. So we would have been, or oh, I'm not seeing Leah, but I see the name. Uh, so, um, Rookie, you, are, you, you was, uh, have also reached out to us to say what it is that the diaspora can do. So we have these interventions. We talk about something we call our PVs. It's our proactive violence intervention strategy. And what this does is allow us to kind of nip reprisals as it gets um, something happens. So we may have a murder. Uh, we rely heavily on our station pastors for this. Um, so they will go in, uh, they are trained, they go in and they speak and how it is that we can minimize reprisals. We're talking about our mediation. Um, I think it was Roger to talk about mentors. We have our mentorship program. We have our field research officers who will go in and they will say, okay, this is what we are seeing in the community. You know, We do referrals. Um, uh, Rene from the ministry will tell you that uh, we, we look at um, like a JCF or we look at um, specific security and justice and we say, okay, this is happening. We have a referral program and we're on the ground every day. So it's easy for us. So we will then refer to the citizen security and justice program to say, okay, this person probably needs counseling. Uh, they need a scale. They need um, some kind of professional assistance, um, whether, whether that's going to be some kind of assessment or something like that. So we do that. We do counseling. Uh, we're talking about, as I said before, what we would have found is that something that is really good for us is the sporting activities. Our communities gravitate towards it. So we'd have been doing and putting out. So, but of course, you know, we're talking about partners, we're talking about effectiveness of what we're doing. And we do believe that community safety, as I told you before, we're talking about 65% for domestic violence, 35% for murders. Um, it's really good for us. So what it allows us to do is to have an effective presence in these communities. We're talking about being able to do conflict assessment. Um, one that is really important for us is a reduction in the fear of crime. Uh, sometimes this is more detrimental to us than the actual crime itself, because once you have that fear, persons um, just shut down totally, so we're not getting anything out of them. We're talking about increased reaction. 
um, between citizens and the police. We're talking about greater confidence um, of um, persons having confidence that we can actually solve or prevent these crimes. So what I've seen that what it is that we're doing, it's working. Um, people will tell you to stop policing, but we like to think it's a combination of operations and, and, and community-based policing. Uh, what it is that we would need, I, I spoke with some of our counterparts out in the divisions and our areas, and they're talking about COVID time. Um, would have seen that we have issued over 10,000 care packages between TSOJ, uh, our private sector, Last for Grace, um, Food for the Poor, uh, who would have given and assisted us with our special needs program. Uh, what they would have said to us that we, we are reaching out to the diaspora, really, how it is that you can assist us. Uh, you know, as I said, extraordinary time, so we're going to need some extraordinary assistance, and this is where you really come in. And it's not, um, Roger could have given a whole host of stuff. We are simplifying ours in the sense that we're saying persons need to food supplies and care packages. This is what we are seeing on the ground. Um, I spoke to uh, my colleague over in Kingston West, and she's saying something as simple as, children clothing. Uh, she's having a challenge in finding these things. We know that September is coming back up and we're talking about things um, from the community safety perspective that we would need. Uh, back to school supplies. Um, one person told me that we need um, more com um, sporting competition, um, dispute resolution training and um, skills training. So these are some of the areas that we're really looking forward to. Uh, we want to thank the our diaspora community for the assistance that has already been given to us. And we really just hope that we can partner more to see how it is that we can really solve the business of crime. So we thank you for the participation and we look forward to more, more dialogue. Thank you, Inspector Palmer. Really appreciate that. We'll now move into Professor Hamilton, who will share about breaking the cycle of poverty and crime prior, during, and post COVID-19. Thank you very much. Um, let me first of all congratulate J.D. Tan for the awesome job that you've done all day. So I've been following, it's really fabulous. And I, I also want to just use this opportunity to um, congratulate and to big up and support um, Inspector Palmer and the work that she does. Um, it's a very tough time for policing in the world perhaps, and in Jamaica. And I want to commend her and her team, the Community Safety and Security Branch of the JCF. Um, they do um, tremendous work and oftentimes we don't recognize it. So I just wanted to start by saying that this is a tough business of tackling crime in the top, uh, one of the countries that are in top five most murderous countries in the world. It is difficult. But um, I want to just share with you what we in the Alaska Chin Foundation have been doing um, over the last few years to tackle this problem before COVID. COVID has, is a reality and what we're planning to do going beyond that. So our mission, our mission essentially to help our at-risk youth break the cycle of poverty and crime. Um, and we want to do that, and we have been doing that by encouraging them to become more entrepreneurial and to become model citizens. We have used a model we call the Sustainable Socioeconomic Intervention Model, and we see this as a multifaceted approach to tackling a very complex problem. Um, it aligns very well with the Jamaica Citizen Security um, Plan that you heard. Um, Brigadier Williams just speak about. But we see this um, like what is described in that plan as only possible with effective partnership. That no one organization, not the police, no single individual can really tackle this thing. So we, we have rolled out four classes of intervention. The first is to support at-risk youths during the schooling years from ages 10 to 17. And also we have rolled out an entrepreneurship program for those who are older age 18 and, and beyond up to about 35. And other supporting programs, including a range of charitable assistance, which have not now become a reality in, in this COVID period. And these activities that we have all align with our um, Vision 2030, as well as our SDGs and a number of them that are highlighted on the screen. 
I want to just take you quickly through two of the programs, the schooling program and the entrep program. So we've targeted one community, um, we're focusing on one high school, and we work with eight feeder schools. And we have a kind of three-prong approach. First phase, we screen and test individuals. So we administer a characteristic risk deprivation measure index actually to measure risk. And we provide a briefing session for parents, gather data. We do all of that in phase one, phase two. We select the students. Um, we put them in groups, groups A, groups B, those that we are going to target and focus, a comprehensive program, others that perhaps we should or to, but just to scale our resources as well as other assessments, they're in another group. And we provide a range of interventions, financial, nutritional, behavioral, psychological support, outreach programs in collaboration with the church and other parental support. And in phase three, we monitor and evaluate. Very, very important for what we do. We develop individual development plans for these kids. We gather the data, monitor the data, provide the kinds of important professional intervention that's needed as the needs arise. Um, quickly, just to give you a sense of the performance, this is a graph of the mean performance over time. Um, when we look at this, um, the data that we have in terms of their conduct, I shouldn't say performance, specifically conduct. On average, we think they're doing well, good to satisfactory. But when we look at their academic performance, what we notice is that about 75% are performing around or just above their class average. That might sound good, but the truth is that the class as a whole is performing at a grade four level. We're talking about a grade seven set of kids, eh? We're talking about at the level of grade four, seven, they ought to be at grade seven level, but they're performing on average um, at grade four with respect to their literacy and numeracy skills. And of course, they're, they're um, exceptions. So, so although they're doing well, um, based on the class average, the class on a whole is not doing well. We thought it was important to provide nutritional support. And that's again, coming from the extensive data we collected, that's a picture of the parents that have benefited pre-COVID um, to, these are in the target group A that have gotten care packages. And we also found it necessary to provide large scale support to the school through a breakfast program because the food needs pre-COVID was a problem. And of course, if kids are hungry, they can't learn. So COVID hits, we decided the first thing we tried to do is to um, respond immediately, but informed with the data. So we asked a number of questions. I'm gonna highlight two. One is, um, does your child have access to um, internet um, instruments that can enable them to learn online, right? So tablets, laptop, most of them said other, and that other was access to mobile phones, but it's their parents' phones. And so they really don't have adequate time to access, and that has been a problem in terms of them keeping up with work. We asked specifically what type of assistance you need now. Overwhelmingly, the response was food and some personal care and so on. So we scaled up our intervention with respect to the food and nutritional support. We rolled out a number of packages, 14,000. We massively um, found partners who were willing to work with us. We found 33 or, since March um, of, of March 10th when this whole thing started. And we estimate the total beneficiaries about 50,000. We thought it was absolutely essential to respond to, the, to this pandemic by reaching out beyond our target group. And that was the level of our support. And I want to say special thanks to our diaspora partners in this effort. Um, our fiscal sponsor, the um, American Foundation for Jamaica, AFJ, the JD Tan team led by Cherie Davis, um, UJAA, Leslie Ann Samuel, the AJAA in Toronto, Ron, Rona Donwell, and Lorna Stanley and friends in Florida. And I'm going to end with a short video to highlight the tremendous work that this Jamaican um, former member of the diaspora, now home, 
has been doing. Areas of support in this area, professional support is key. The online learning, especially in the area of literacy and numeracy, is critical. And the, we think it is important to continue to assess not only the psychosocial um, uh, assessment of the kids, but also of their parents. Um, because we think that those, there has been a lot of stress, as we all know, coming out of COVID. And of course, ongoing support for care packages. Let me quickly go to the entrepreneurship program. Um, since our inception, we've rolled out this entrepreneurship program, and it starts with a broad introduction to entrepreneurship, and we provide a range of information and sometimes products just to give people a feel for what it takes to really make it in the world of business. And we rolled out about 372 persons who we engaged. Um, we had about 157 engaged in a three-day training program. And then we have a very intensive sales program, about six months, as we separate people who are really serious about being in business from those who are not. And some persons actually go back to school coming out of it, um, some find jobs, but we get at the end of it, people who are serious about doing business. We had 31 of them and 12 were in a longer term support having finished the six months. Note that um, we had the whole movement from three day training into our six months program was interrupted with COVID. And that's why those numbers are fairly big. In terms of qualitative assessments of the benefits of the program, um, just quickly, we in the, the Montego Bay cohort, um, I, and I just mentioned, you know, we were in St. James, um, Trelawney, St. Catherine, Clarendon, St. Anne, and, and St. Mary. In, in, in Montego Bay, we, we worked with a group and they did tremendously well. Um, one person was able to reach out to her neighbors, two disabled members of the disabled community that she was able to help because of the income she generated out of this program. Um, one person showed up, showed off a new bathroom that she built. Um, persons were able to buy freezers, rent shop, and actually somebody paid down on a piece of land to build their dream home. So we found that people truly benefited Quanti quanti quantitatively. What we were able to assess was the rate of savings, the savings as an asset that they can use in the business. When they started the program in cohort one, only 10% of them had savings. By the time they ended 67 in cohort, cohort one had savings. When we moved to, to cohort two, and of course we retweaked and improved our program, we found that about the same number started, 11% had savings, but 100% ended with savings at the end. And so we see that there are really benefits of working with this group and getting them to a position where they can truly um, benefit. What's the significance of that savings for times like these, COVID, where sales are disruptive, they have to cope, they have to survive. And what we found when we asked them, how have you survived? What, did you, what money did you rely on to cope during COVID? We noted that 63% of them said they relied on savings and 63 relied on the income they earned. We've actually been doing a preliminary analysis of a comparable group. Um, most of them are not earning. And although they may have comparable savings, what we're finding is that their capacity to earn, even in this tough time, was sustained. And so that's very good. Also shows the role of remittances, because nearly 40% of them are relying on remittances during this period. And some of it I know is being plugged into the business for sustainability. Let me quickly end with this video. It's a very short video that highlights the work of Lorna Stanley.
I don't think the audio is coming through. What we can do is post it on the page after. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. All right. So basically what I wanted to do was just to end by pointing to a number of, um, of areas where the diaspora could collaborate. Um, and I'll just bring that up quickly. Um, that's the, uh, just the last slide here. Um, the, there's just a few areas and, oh, let me just do that, right. So more direct um, support for income generation. This is the kind of work that we're currently doing um, to train for that post COVID economy because people, the businesses have to be prepared for that. Um, we are also preparing entrepreneurs for a cashless economy and to more transactions online because that's really where um, the economy is heading and of course more support. So those are the areas I thought we, we, we certainly could collaborate with and to continue the excellent work that we're doing. I wanna thank you and thank the JD Tan for this awesome engagement. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Really appreciate that presentation. Now we'll go. Um, we'll hear from Mr. Dewitt Jeffrey. He will share about the police youth clubs and discuss how they are coping during these times and how they are safeguarding youth against violence. Mr. Jeffrey. Hi. Good night, everybody. Can you hear me clearly, Rookie? Yes. Wonderful. Good night, everybody. Um, please, um, if you hear noise in the background, forgive me. I just came from a meeting with some young people. So I pulled over and started off the road to facilitate this meeting. It's always, I'm always on the move, my apologies. I must greet every single person who is in here. I greet you and I thank you for the work that you have been doing. It is not being done um, under any secrecy. You are being seen and the effects are falling into place. Um, I am, as what was mentioned before, I'm the president for the youth council. That means that I control or supervise rather 50 poor, 54 police youth clubs um, in area four. I'm also the president for Gold Street Police Youth Club. Um, it is indeed a pandemic. It is a hard season. And so because of what has been happening, our meetings are now online. So all our meetings are virtual. And we encourage all the 54 clubs um, to host their meetings from a virtual perspective. Um, coping this season is very difficult, but we have been trying our best to cope. Um, we have been encouraging our members, or rather having motivational sessions with them about stress, stress management and how to coping mechanisms that will really help them to move forward. Um, we have been really focusing on what they like to do, what keep their minds at peace. And from a counseling perspective, we have been offering counseling to persons who are in distress. And I also have been communicating with schools in the corporate area that would help in facilitating that process because mental health in this season is very, very, very important. Uh, we have also been encouraging them, as I said before, um, how to balance stress or to balance their life in general as to not to totally focus on COVID-19, but remember that there's life after this. And how, matter of fact, we have been encouraging them, but guess what? This is the new normal, and that this is how you have to cope from here, and this is how you manage your time wisely. And we have been partnering with um, stakeholders in this season to help in managing um, COVID-19. If I should mention, um, mainly, of course, the JCF is one of our main sponsors, um, the CSS body to be um, specific. We have been partnering with Grace Kennedy, um, the Bank of Jamaica, other private sectors that would have helped us, assisted us in care packaging for our students, for our members of um, the various youth clubs in this trying time. We are also presently having conversations with other stakeholders because what we think is important now is for our members to understand that hygiene, good hygiene is optimal in this season and all of us to really cope, we have to stay clean as it would have been declared that cleansiness is close to godliness. So we're encouraging um, cleansiness. So we, we are encouraging the police youth clubs in this season that we want to, in our communities, to have sanitization um, stations. So we are promoting healthiness. If each community can have um, sanitization um, stations in their community, that would help in the whole hygiene effort and 
accepting the whole new norm of COVID-19. Violence, of course, is on the rise in various communities. And of course, I am part of Central, I live in the Central um, Kingston Division that is presently under the state of emergency. What we have been doing to decrease crime are to, to um, both pre and post methods that we have been doing. We have been having sessions, empowerment sessions with our clubites, assuring them that, listen, that you are still in the position to become the best version of yourself. We have been doing positive reinforcement, telling them that, listen, we know that this is a trying time, but there is still excellence in you, that greatness still lies within you. We have also been helping them to capitalize on the internet, being at home now. We have been encouraging them to find creative means and ways of earning money online. So no one needs to steal. You can also occupy your time wisely online, creating that internet is now a market, a big market. So how to use it wisely, getting familiar with the various uh, media and modems so that work, so being at home can become effective. Gasper, we have what we need. What, how can you help? Is that so many of our students are behind in school. Uh, if I should speak specifically to the, the presidency of being the president for Gold Street Police Youth Club, we need technology. That's the area that we're in. So we want to host our own homework centers. We want to host our own um, setting that students can come in, get their work online done, and to facilitate the, the teaching learning experience, which is very important at this point in time. What we want also to have coaches and counselors readily available to facilitate our students in this season, to facilitate the leaders that may need help, members of the community that are in distress and need help from various angles. So if we have those things in place intact, I think that will facilitate the decrease in crime and also the increase in education that is most needed at this time. We have students and children who are at home. It's difficult for parents financially and it's a strain. We want every company, every the diaspora, everybody who is in area of our voice tonight to facilitate care packaging. Anything that you have that can give to a family that is, in, that, is that is able to facilitate them in this season, we readily accept it. And to the persons listening, because I know that I have persons and youth from the police youth club listening to our tune, it is not over. This is the beginning of something great. And we have all these stakeholders here readily, readily availing themselves for the greater good of our nation. And in advance, I want to thank you for hearing our cry, for hearing our petitions. And we trust that after we have left this meeting, that things will fall into place. That everything that we have been working for will not go unsaid or unseen. So that is my seven minutes. <laughs> I have a next meeting to run to, unfortunately. That's my seven minutes. And we are standing in agreement. The Bible says in Amos 3, verse 3, can two walk except they agree? And from our conversations tonight, we seem to be in agreement. And we are anticipating this awesome partnership from East, West, North, and South. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jeffrey. We really appreciate um, your presentation. Thank you. We will now hear from we will now hear from Ms. Renee Steele, who will share with us about the targeted approach to reducing risk violence amongst younger children. Thank you, okay. Good night, everyone. And thank you to JD Tan for this special invitation. To my fellow panelists, great to see you all again. So I'll jump into it. Just permit me to share my screen. Okay, so since around 2017, the latter part of 2017, when it is that there was a significant spike in levels of violence um, across particular focal points in Jamaica, Kingston, St. Andrew, Hanover, St. James, Westmoreland, Clarendon, and St. Catherine, there was a real need to re-examine how it is that we were designing our interventions. I heard several of my panelists um, before, fellow panelists before, speak about the need to really zoom in on our youth, our children, 
And what we're cognizant of is that uh, when it comes on to gangs, organized criminal networks, there is a deliberate act to feed or prey on the vulnerability of our young persons. And that is predominantly demonstrated in recruitment. When those recruitment occur, recruitment occurs predominantly as low as the grade five, grade six level, and it goes into the secondary school. So in partnership with the Ministry of Education, in support of their school-wide positive behavior intervention support framework, we worked in tandem to develop a framework focusing on a targeted risk to violence reduction in selected schools and communities. There were several different inputs in terms of lessons learned that were infused in the methodology, predominantly lessons learned from our CSJP3, that is the Citizen Security and Justice Program. Likewise, there were lessons learned from interventions being implemented by members in civil society, so the Child Resilience Program on the Van Prevention Alliance. Several stakeholder consultations were held. So this is what was done to inform this approach. The approach is also strongly aligned and in support of the citizen security plan that Brigadier Williams would have outlined. And you see elements of similarities when it is that I go through the presentation. So this is the outline. Let me just read it. All right, so here's the outline. And just quickly, the situational analysis, you know, we have an epidemic of violence in Jamaica. So in 2016, we had the world's highest violent death rate for females. In 2017, to which I referred, we recorded 1,615 1, murders, for which only 30% of our parishes contributed to that, the parishes to which I um, referred earlier. And those parishes accounted for 70% of homicides. So you see where it is that the violence persists, but it occurs within pockets in our, in, in our country. Now, despite a 21% reduction in murders in 2018, we still recorded 1,217 for a homicide rate of 47 per 100,000, right? And at the end of 2019, we maintained the highest homicide rate in the region and it's the fourth highest in the world. In relation to what it costs us as a country, violence-related injuries cost the Jamaican healthcare system 12% of the annual budget. Direct cost of care of VRIs is estimated at 3.6 million. And indirect cost of VRIs is estimated at $5 billion. So we ask ourselves, why does violence occur? Uh, Natalie, you spoke heavily about the risks that children and young persons face. We use this model to guide us to say to ourselves, there is a direct relationship between the individual, i.e. the child, the relationship that that child is, um, experiences, so relationship with family, with peers, with social systems in the child's community, that direct relationship between the child and the wider community and inevitably wider, um, the wider society. So when it is that you are looking at the balance between risk factors versus protective factors, what we find is that our children who are most at risk are heavily, heavily um, consumed, heavily consumed by an imbalance of this risk and protective um, factor. So for argument's sake, if you have a home with a child and a single parent, the goal is not to say, find another parent for the home. The goal is to say, let us see how it is that we can make that single parent, the best single parent that he or she can be, to be a stronger protective factor to the child. What are the key factors which dispose or predispose our children to violence in Jamaica? It's our cultural norms. Jamaicans, we seem to be embedded with this culture that violence is the answer. Um, we see that predominantly in our parent and children um, relationships. When the child misbehaves or is out of hand, the first resort is to use violence. Limit access to limited education, poverty, to which Professor Hamilton spoke about in her presentation, a lack of opportunities for young persons, an inadequate enforcement of and protection under our laws, weakened family structures, high levels of exposure to violence and broken or insufficient coordination against key actors. 
So in terms of some of the previous approaches, because no system is perfect and it remains a, a work in progress, but there were some notable pitfalls in how it is that we were doing business as usual. So again, making reference to this intermittent coordination among stakeholders. So you have a community space and you have several actors working in that same space, not maintaining open communication and dialogue with each other to ensure that it's the persons who are greatest at risk for getting access to the services. A lack of sustained integrated series of community-based activities. The work of social intervention and youth violence prevention takes time. It takes time and it takes money. So when it is that you're talking about modification of behavior, you're not looking at a by the night or an overnight result. We have to keep committed to the cause. And in terms of community readiness, um, one of my panelists made reference to it. You have to ensure that the interventions that you're going into a community, the community is actually ready for it. So the responses have to be tailored to the needs of the communities. Some of these designs were informed by a knee-jerk reaction. So there's a flare-up, and then we jump to react, in, as, instead of, as opposed to really looking at the situation and looking at the data. And this results in sometimes a misguided allocation of human and financial resources. There's also, there was also the gap between social intervention, social services, and that of community-based policing. We are now working to bridge that gap to ensure that where it is that our community safety and security branch is fully operational and they're working for the communities that we are there behind them giving the full support. So in terms of the framework, these are the key tenets. So there are 21 priority communities, which are a subset of the 52 which Brigadier would have referred to earlier. On. Focus on children from eight to 16. There are school clusters which would have been established coming from those communities. That include secondary schools and feeder primary schools, using music, sports, and technology as means of sustainable, positive youth engagement. A continued focus on young persons, age 18 to 29, greater support to community-based policing, and of course, working with the community to empower them and build their resilience. So those key tenets are why it is that we think that this is workable, but of course, it's not, it's not possible without the inputs of our key partners and all our communities, all our country. So again, focusing on the target age group of eight to 16 years, there's a real need to focus on our children. We are working to cut off that feeding pipe to the gangs, to reduce the children's levels of vulnerability. How do we do this? Professor Hamilton would have spoken to the model in terms of examining the risks to violence of the child and the child support systems and impacting on how it is that violence would have affected the child, the degree of trauma that violence would have posed on the child that predisposes the child to delinquency later on in life. The approach is an integrated response and Brigadier William spoke at length in terms of how it is that we are working to better coordinate and integrate. And community ownership and involvement is key because you, have, you, you establish resilience when it is that the community is there from the get-go the community articulates what the issues are, what it is that they need and the level of support that is required. And I would have referenced some of the examples of success using this approach. So there is a CSJP3. There was a pilot that we did in four, four primary schools. There was an additional school that benefited from the summer program component of that pilot. And the Violence Prevention Alliance is Child Resilience Program. All three programs use elements of this methodology. So when we did a gap analysis um, in terms of the schools that we identified, I'll show you that um, soon. Despite high levels of violent crimes, especially homicides, in and around the communities that these particular schools are located in, what we found was that uh, most schools only had one to two guidance counselors and zero to one social workers. There was no standard and consistent mechanism to measure incidents of violence in the school. Again, low performing academics and the academics and the reading ability, as Professor Hamilton said, below the age and grade levels. Remedial programs affording the schools where you actually have remedial programs, it wasn't a standard asset in the school. Limited structured extracurricular activities and the limited teacher welfare programs. So for any school to function effectively, you have to work with the students 
work with the families, but also work with the school and its administration. And our teachers are overwhelmed. So there's a need to support our teachers through building, working with them to build their capacity to better cope with the situation that surrounds them on a daily basis. So this is just a matrix um, identifying those uh, priority communities. As I said, it's a subset of what Brigadier would have referenced. And we worked with the Ministry of Education to identify secondary schools, where it is that we, based on the data, showed high levels of gang activity in the school or linked to the school and the predominant feeder primary schools. As of May, of this year, we are currently case managing around 610 young persons coming from these schools. The ones in red have been prioritized for the 2021 financial year. And of course, we've, have, we've had to be quite creative in, in our interactions and interventions because of the onset of COVID. This process floor program design was adapted from the Pathways to Success Initiative what it shows is um, a model of any community that it is that we're seeking to support or reduce vulnerability and risk. And you see where you have a child right here. It also shows you the different social systems or social um, structures in a community that a child would interact for any given reason. What it is that we need to do is to create a safety bubble for the child that when the child from early childhood, there's a system there of early detection to then know that the child needs to be referred to, for example, um, child guidance clinic. Support needs to be given to the child guidance clinic that supports its community to ensure that they have sufficient resources to meet the needs of that child. And likewise, the pathway takes you to the primary school, to the hospital, to the police station. So in terms of coining support, it is about communication across stakeholders, communication in terms of where are the priority areas, what are the priority needs, how can we work together to meet those needs, again, to create this safety bubble. And as Brigadier would have mentioned, the role of the Ministry of National Security in relation to the Citizen Security Plan is to serve as the lead coordinator for access to social services. So what we have done as at January of this year, we've established a working group that comprises of representatives from key ministries, departments and agencies who are expected or invited to implement programs within the context of the CSP. What that means is that when it is that we go into any given space and the needs are identified, we have direct points of contacts that we can then refer our clients to for them to access the services in a, in a timely manner, a timely manner. Um, the final note, a quote by Henry Ford, coming together is the beginning, keeping together is progress, but working together is success. So in terms of what we need from the diaspora, I will yield to Brigadier Williams' final slide, to which I fully endorse. Uh, partnership is the key. Partnership is the key. Coordination is the key. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Steele. Really appreciate that presentation. We'll now move into Mr. Clayton, who will share about the Community Renewal Program, um, coordination and collaboration in common spaces, and an evidence-based approach towards intervention. Mr. Clayton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and greetings to the panel, all my friends on the panel, and to the diaspora out there. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here tonight, and I just want to say how much of a pleasure it is for me to be working with the diaspora, who I found to be so energetic and enthusiastic in the time since we have started working together. And I know, if not for COVID-19, would have been well on the way with the number of projects that I've seen you working on so far. And I'm looking forward to our continuing and deep in the work that you're doing as the space and time permits. Now, I, at this point, I guess I don't have very much time left on hand because um, based on the time schedule, I probably have about two minutes left out of the seven. So I won't bother to go into the um, diagram that I had to present. I'm going to be as brief as I can be. First of all, 
the community renewal program is different to the other programs here. It is not an implementing entity. It was designed to support and enhance the delivery of services in targeted spaces. Um, when it came into being, there was no other coordinating entity and we developed a mechanism for measuring or estimating the level of volatility and vulnerability of communities. And on that basis, using an index, we selected 100 of what we considered at that time the most volatile and vulnerable communities. Since then, there has been a pattern of vulnerability and volatility established in other parishes, including West Milan and Hannibal, which have been added to that mix. But at the time, we were dealing with just five parishes, Kingston, St. Andrews, St. Catherine, Clarendon, and St. James. We fully support the addition of West Milan and Hanover now because there's a clear pattern established in those parishes which demonstrates the vulnerability of those communities there. Now, in terms of the mechanisms that we, we tried to establish a framework through which entities could collaborate and target the community spaces. We recognize, as Vinnie pointed out earlier on in Brigadier, that entities had been working as in silos. And while they were doing good work to target individual um, beneficiaries here or there, it was not serving the purpose of changing the character of the communities that they were targeting. So as we can see, we have all been tearing out all here over time, seeing what we can do to change the character of these communities and to change the results that we are seeing out there. And what we have all come to is the idea that without coordination and targeting in common spaces, we will not get the results that we're looking for because we'll be operating in silos and we'll not get the big picture as to what the basic community needs are and what are the issues that we need to target and how we need to address them. So what we've tried to do is to provide a framework for better targeting and provide the information that can support this. In the framework that we're provided, it supports, we, we are supportive of the civil security plan and Plan Secure Jamaica, because we are supporting mechanism and we are trying to provide information to give support to that and to give a framework in which entities that seek to support the framework can find a, bit, a more targeted approach. So we identified six broad pillars that we thought would be areas that we would need to look at as lens of visibility when we're looking at our community. And those six pillars are governance, social transformation, socioeconomic development, um, safety and justice, uh, youth development, and physical transformation, encompassing, in summary, the pillars also of Vision 2030 Jamaica. And we thought that if, if you were going to look at a community, you'd have to look in terms of all these areas to, to be able to determine where the weaknesses and strength lay. And since then, we have worked with the Social Development Commission to identify an, a coordinating mechanism through the what they call the interagency network, which brings all in agencies in a parish together in one common framework to look at the parish as a whole and see where they need to target. But we have also developed in the background tools that we think can be helpful to our partners who are implementing to identify the status of a community in terms of its vulnerability and volatility and the status of a community in terms of its readiness for intervention from any particular agency. And in that regard, there are two tools that we have developed, which we are now testing through data. One is what we call the Community Readiness Index, which gives an idea to implementing entities as to what state of readiness a community is for a particular intervention. And the second tool is what we call the Community Renewal Index, which is a composite index that tries to capture information on six areas in one single numeral. And it gives an idea of where the community is in terms of those six areas that are being measured. We are in the process now of determining what targets should be set or what would be the baseline of a developed community when we measure by that index. And we will share with our partners shortly once we have finished the testing and validation of those two indices. The third tool that we have developed, which will assist the process is a database, which will allow entities to be able to input data remotely and to be able to draw down on data to see how their particular performance is going and to see how their particular performance is affecting the entire picture in any particular community and in the nation as a whole. 
and that's an integrated database that pulls together a range of information, both qualitative and quantitative data. And we are now finalizing testing and then we'll be sharing with our partners. So this tool we feel can support Plan Secure Jamaica and the City Security Plan because it offers an avenue, a ready-made avenue for measurement and testing. So in short, what our role is, is to provide um, a mechanism from evidence-based approaches to decision-making and to provide a mechanism by which entities will be able to determine where to place their resources and how well activities that are taking place in these community spaces are contributed to the changes that we want to see happen. So that in a nutshell is the Community Renewal Program and what we want to contribute to it. So the information I can post a uh, more detailed presentation on the network. But I hope I've not used up the two minutes that I had left. Thank you, Mr. Clayton, much appreciated. So like I mentioned before, this panelist discussion is an opportunity for us to hear from Jamaica regarding the citizen security plan. And we have heard from different partners on the ground in Jamaica. Now it's time to hear from the diaspora panelists. Um, just a few questions to Mr. Kevin Jr. and Judge Norman Hemming. From your experiences, from um, how can the diaspora help based on what you have heard the needs are from the people on the ground? We can start can with. Kevin Let Kevin go first. Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, for first, I'd like to th thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this. And I really appreciate the, the breadth and depth of knowledge that, that I gained tonight based on what's going on on the ground. Um, the, the, this might, might be um, sad to say, but I think the best thing that the diaspora can do is to be properly organized. I think at this point, there are a number of energetic, engaged people that want to get out there and, and they're gonna change the world by themselves or by the, their small group. But if, if there was an opportunity to, um, I, I think um, Ms. Steele, you, you said it very well, that it's about partnership and coordination. So if there can be an effective um, coordination uh, among the diaspora, then I, I, I think the resources that we're already investing and we have that's out there, it will be able to address a number of the issues that, that have been brought forward. Um, uh, I don't remember who was the speaker that, that said that, you know, there, there are needs in the different areas. And um, I think it was, it was Inspector Palmer, you go into the community and don't tell them what they need, they'll tell you what they need. And um, you've done a very good job tonight in telling us um, what is required. I think the next step is to do uh, a proper gap analysis, right? Uh, and by that, I'm saying, what is the current state? Um, how can you handle the current state, right? And then we'll identify what you can't do and then that's where we'll fill the gap. So I think that's a, that's a partnership that I think is required. And then we can have that overall coordination so that people are feeding into that gap and not into what we feel that, you know, this is my community, this is what I want to do for my community. No, it's about, there's a strategy, there's a plan in place, let's address that. Sir, did you want to um, add to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Thank you, Kevin. Um, wonderful, I, I was blown away this evening by what I heard uh, from the various panelists and different things that were happening in Jamaica with respect to the citizen security plan. What I will say to you is this, that you are the source of inspiration for the diaspora. And in fact, the diaspora can do a lot more than just remittances. I understand you have 19 police in district. I understand that there are 50 communities that account for 44% of the murders and, and gang-related crime. But the diaspora community can do a lot more than just um, be the source of funding. We can be the source of funding to the extent that we represent some 15% of the, of the GDP of Jamaica in terms of remittances coming in. But I think we can do more in terms of targeted remittances for, various, for the various areas that you have, you have identified. Right? But in addition to that, um, I think that there is an area of expertise and professionalism that you can also get not only on the island, but also from throughout the diaspora. Listen, we, you have members of your diaspora 
who um, lead, were police chief in, in Toronto, who serve as a police chief in the city of Miramar, who serve on the National Security Council for the United States, right, as, as, an, as the NSA advisor to former presidents. You have um, um, uh, Jamaica na descendants of Jamaicans who serve as the attorney, who, who have served as the attorney general for the state of California. But would, that would have been the ninth richest country on the face of the earth if they were an independent country. Right? You, you have people from all throughout the Caribbean who have been heavily involved in, in law enforcement, as well as in strategic um, programs that are aimed at reducing crime and violence. The Violence Reduction Partnership, which was proposed by the US Department of Justice under the Obama administration, was something that I worked on and that was put in place by a, by a, by a Bayesian um, American, right? Eric Holder, who was the then Attorney General. But even today, you still have people like um, a Jamaican serving just appointed this year during the midst of COVID to serve as on the Supreme Court of the state of Florida. You, you have Jamaican serving, Kristen Clark serving as a National Lawyers um, Committee for Civil Rights, uh, for the Center for American Progress, uh, Michelle Jawando. Um, all of these Jamaican people who are serving, and it's not something that is new, we've always served in these capacities and we've always been able to help. You have organizations like your alumni association that you need to leverage more. So you have the Jamaica College Old Boys Association where I serve with Xavier Murphy, the CEO for Jamaicans.com that's um, uh, broadcasting this here this evening. And, and Xavier through his leadership for, the, for Jamaica College. And the same thing is, can be done with all the other alumni associations have targeted funding during this COVID time to make sure that the budget of Jamaica College is buttressed not only by the the Florida-based chapter of the Alumni Association, but the Canadian chapter by the New York chapter, right? And the same thing can be done for every school, whether that we're purple and white or blue and white, right? We all can, can help. And we can participate and lend a hand with respect to shot spotter programs um, in these 50 communities in Jamaica that are in need of help. We can lend a hand in terms of the violence reduction partnership that uh, we can contribute to in terms of expertise, but also monies through USAID that can go towards one of those types of programs. And let me, let me be quiet, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Judge Hammond. Um, so my next question to the diaspora panel is, any suggestions on how we can encourage the diaspora groups working within this field and in this sector, citizen security and safety on meet this call for action? Yes. Uh, I'll Go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. No, go ahead. Um, I, again, I, I don't think it's a matter of encouraging them. I, I believe that there are members from the diaspora. They're chomping at the bit to help. They would like to get engaged. Um, I don't know what the disconnect is, but I, I, I reviewed a, a letter that was written um, this week, and um, I, I told the, the individual that. I can't use the words that, that they're using, right? Because um, we we want to form a partnership. We don't want to to to, to se separate each other. So I, I think there is there is a lot of energy that's out there. People are people are ready, willing to to get involved. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure exactly how to do it, and they're not sure how to how to do it. Um, you know, I can I can speak of different organizations right now who say, I want to get in, but they won't, they won't listen to me. I think the judge said it very well. There, there are individuals who have a lot of expertise that's, that's re ready ready to go. Um, as, as you mentioned, we've got police chiefs, et cetera, who are, who are myself, I've been down to Jamaica, I've, I've done things. It's not a matter of um, we are not engaged. It's once we get there, we start doing something, what's the fruits? Right. What's the return on the investment? Um, we're, 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 we're not seeing the end results. And I, I think if there's a way that um, the engagement can be encouraged and that it is actually fruitful, then people will keep on coming back. But at this point, when individuals are coming out and say, I'm doing this, and then I walk away, and it's, it's for naught, then um, why, why, why do I want to come back? And I think I think that that's a challenge right now. It's not um, encouraging individuals. I don't know, sir. What do you, Rookie? If I may, but if I could just respond specifically to what has worked, 
Um, I, I, and, and the approach I would suggest is to plug into an ex partner in Jamaica on the ground that is engaging in a long-term measurable type of intervention. That's how you know you have impact. And I want to say um, that the work we're doing in the Last Coaching Foundation, we did a lot of um, foundation work in getting baseline studies with the help of the diaspora. Um, Dr. Gretel Bradford and, um, and her colleague, um, would you help me, Bre Gretel, you're online. <laughs> Gordon, Beverly Gordon, Dr. Beverly Gordon. Um, Dr. Beverly Gordon, so um, we're there. And, 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 you know, we did these studies that looked at, you know, the psychosocial assessments of the kids and they did a tremendous work and it really helped us because the scale of the intervention was significant. And so we're able to monitor and they are, a, they are also able to track the progress of these kids. So what I presented was just where we are at this moment and in another year's time, they'll see the fruits of that work. So um, it's, it's, been, it's engaging a partner who can sustain the intervention. It's not one-off. I think we've seen decades of one-off interventions on the part of as, as, as phenomenal as it has been. But the reality is that both the efforts of the diaspora and us here in Jamaica have not cracked this problem of crime. We see it persisting. And so I think what Renee said, what everybody has been saying is that we have to coordinate much more effectively. And if we can do that and measure and sustain the intervention, we can see some changes over time. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I truly believe moving forward from, from here, um, we, we've now entered into a dialogue, right? And it, it can't end tonight. We, 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 need, we need to continue this dialogue. And um, I heard one voice tonight from, from all the presenters. And if, if we can get that one voice to be um, echoed across the diaspora, right? Then I think we will have that meaningful partnership and that partnership will generate the coordination that is required in order for us to go forward. Because if, if we don't have that effective coordination, then we will not be able to, to move forward. So there, 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 from lessons learned, there's been an, a number of positive cases, right? So let's build on those and, and see that the others um, that can come on board to make sure that, that we, we've identified the gap and we're filling the gap and not doing something that, that's already been done. All right, um, I, I'd, I'd like to just jump in. Um, uh, um, for, 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 for both um, Norman, Judge Norman and Kevin, um, I'd like if you guys could join us, the JD Tan and understand the work that we do and why we have these panelists here in our midst. One of the things that we do very well is to do gaps assessment, needs assessment. Our, our team of close to 500 individuals across the world, right? Our network of close to 500 individuals across the world. We don't take anything for granted. We don't approach Jamaica with no individual approach because that does not work. And we know that over the past 40 years that that has not That's worked. Right. And it, it doesn't work for one organization with 15 or 10 or 20 persons to work either. We need a collaboration of yes. businesses, schools, uh, police departments, any kind of collaboration that we have in the United States, in Canada, in, 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 in England or UK to come together. And our network has, uh, is, has a total of 22 countries across the world that we bring experts together under one umbrella with 16 tax task forces. One of the task forces has a total of 140 persons, the education task force. And then we have others with 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 persons, totaling over close to 500. And we have access 
of over 40,000 Jamaicans on our email, all right? All right, so I tell you that to put that into perspective, that we were in Jamaica very recently in January. And these persons on the panel sat with 22 of us for three or four days, talking about all of the things that you hear them talk about. And, and what we went there for was just to go down and listen and ask questions so that we can understand what the gaps are. What this is, is an opportunity to broaden it so that everybody in the diaspora hears what it is that these gentlemen has to say, right? Or ladies and gentlemen, I mean. And I, I want to take up um, uh, Renee when she says something about Henry Ford, when she says partner. One of the great things that we hope to have in this, Renee, is that with the committee that you're forming, that you can reach out to one of our experts in Dr. Um, uh, Grethel or Dr. Beverly or Carleen Tomlinson, any one of the 30 persons sitting on the Behavioral Health Task Force and ask them to join your committee so that we are at the table when you start the planning so that we can have an opportunity to be there and plan with you, show you what we have, you show us what you have, and then we can put it together. So our teams together, our 16 task, task forces had come together to put on a one week of action during the first week of June, but COVID took care of that. But instead of providing the physical, then we turn to virtual. And so Renee and uh, um, uh, Brigadier Williams and, 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 and Inspector Palmer, what I would like is since we are now in the virtual space, we have formulated plans with La Sierra University and Loma Linda University to provide 30 workshops in professional development. We would like to have your police officers join us in July 7th through 9th so that we have both police officers, nurses, and teachers taking advantage of these workshops that we have. And then we will get more information from them because they are people on the ground doing the things that they do best. So we will now have firsthand experience, not just from a report that, 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 um, that uh, Mr. Clayton and, and the other guys, but then we have personal experiences so that we can apply these things and get some, uh, some, some additional knowledge that they can use. So we customize it for, that, for, that, for, 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 for your, 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 your work. So I'm asking like um, uh, Kevin, come on over and join the task force so that you understand that we take things from the ground up and we become a part of the policy making. We become a part of the, 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 the rollout of projects. That's why we're here. I'm looking at all of the red spots in that, 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 that um, Brigadier Williams had. And, and there, in, in our history in America, there was something called redlining. It's where black people were, post, were posted in particular communities and on the maps across the country, you know, they, it would show red marks that shows these are the people that are black people in this. And then all the white people would walk out and uh, out into the country and develop, um, develop areas out there. Black people then became what you call, they don't provide any loans to those communities. Those communities get run down and all of a sudden, um, the black people are being over-policed and under-protected. So I hate red, red marks on maps because it reminds me of redlining that I, I, I think about. So if we could use something like black or, 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 or yellow or something like that. But, but I'm saying this because this is how we exchange knowledge and share expertise and share, and, and share the, uh, the relationship so that we can do better with this. 
And, and so, no, no, I don't want to hear us talk about, oh, well, we have one, uh, a, a big policeman out there on a, or another one in California. I want to hear us taking all of those guys together and put them together and say, hey, let, let's go to Jamaica and do some, some, some needs assessment and some gaps assessment and get it done. That's what I want to hear. Thanks. Uh, and, and sorry if, if I took point. We appreciate your, uh, your passion. Um, Judge Hemming, I want to go back to you so you can finish yes. your thought. Yeah, so th th thank you. This is the exciting thing. Why I like organizations like this, and I think that you can do a, a world of good, and all the panelists um, here that were here tonight, is that part of the problem for, for folks in the not-for-profit sector, in the, in the religious community, um, in the government sector, um, in law enforcement, is that they, they worry about organizations that they become a part of, and then they have to register in the United States as agents of a foreign state if they work with that. But this organization and organizations like this um, give you the freedom <laughs> to actually work in developing Jamaica outside of any political um, affiliations and outside of any um, uh, strict governmental entities. So much so that you're not worried about registering as an agent of a foreign right. uh, country when you're doing some work to help. And I think that if we bring together the commercial interests um, here in the diaspora, as well as governmental leaders in the diaspora of Jamaican heritage and other Caribbean heritage, uh, as we bring together the and, and have targeted um, remittances, not only coming from individuals to uh, family members back there, but from churches here, from mosques here, from, um, from Jewish temples here who have uh, relatives there, um, then we'll, we'll see a very different uh, law enforcement strategy uh, taking place, one that very much mirrors what was put together here in terms of the violence reduction partnership that I worked with and what sounds, what echoes like what we're doing um, in Jamaica. There's so much more that we can do and I'm excited about the law enforcement in Jamaica and security. Great things are going to happen. Okay, could, could I just add one, one point? I, I think, um, as I said, uh, I, I think this is a brilliant start to where I think we need to go. Um, Leo, you, you, you said, said it very well. Um, you've galvanized a number of individuals that, that's outside. I'm not concerned about them. I'm concerned about the others, right? The ones who have a lot of energy and a lot of resources, but it's not being channeled where we need it. So it's to get that strategic communication out there to individuals to say, we know that you're there. We know that you want um, help. This is how we want you to challenge your resources and your expertise. I think that's where we need to go to. Thank you all. In the interest of time, I will just like to close out and thank everyone for taking part in this um, panel. Your presentations were great. There's a lot of questions. We have about 10 questions in our question and answer, and we have some Facebook questions. We won't be able to get to the questions right now because we're running over time for the closing ceremony. But rest, rest assured, um, in the wrap up, we'll make sure those um, questions, we'll make sure those questions are answered in the wrap up. So please know that your questions will be answered. But thank you all again for participating. Appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you all. Yeah, great to see you all. Thank you all. Wonderful panel, everyone. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. Leah, over to you for closing. Well, uh, thank you, boy. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't like to just dry, dry close off stuff like that. You know, I want, I really want to hear uh, a person's wrap up. Just I'd give one for each person one minute to just go ahead and say something, what you felt of tonight. Where do we go? Just, just, just take one minute and, and say. So I'll start with uh, um, uh, Brigadier Roger. Go in the same, the same order that we went on just now. One, one minute each, please. Thank you, Leo. Um, what I'd like to use opportunity to say is that I think all of Jamaica's problems are within our gift to solve. There's absolutely nothing that is that, that we have seen as a challenge or we're talking about tonight that we can't resolve as Jamaicans, whether we are on the rock or in the diaspora. Huh. And, need is is all hands on deck and i think we all touched on that, that key need to have the partnership to have the coordination to make sure we're all 
putting all our efforts in the same direction. And I think once we get that right, uh, there's nothing that we can't achieve. And, 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 I, and I too am very excited because I think, I think we are at a point now in our development as a nation. And again, this is Jamaica, no, irrespective of where you are, you are Jamaicans. So the nation of Jamaica, I think is at a point where it, it genuinely believes that it can solve, solve it all, its own problems. Um, and that excites me. And I'm looking forward to us realizing that through our combined efforts. Oh, good job. Thank you so much, Brigadier. Next person. Who was second? I mean, that okay. was me. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to thank you and your team. I know we have been continuing the dialogue. This is not our first uh, meeting at any at all. And really, I appreciate that. We talk about partnership. There's some things that we can do alone. Some we need a little help. Some we need a lot of help. Um, we're going to make sure that we, that can assist us here in Jamaica. That I'm just happy that you're able to put it out um, wider for other persons to see the work that you're doing and how they can assist us. And we just thank you for that partnership. So um, thanks to all the panelists who, who are on board. Thanks to your members. We really appreciate your support. You know, I would just say one, one, cook a full basket. <laughs> <laughs> that let us just pick a target group. Let's work it. This is, this, you know, we're talking crime and security. You, you're really talking about long-term problems. It took a long time for us to get here. It won't take a long time for us to get out. It has been exacerbated with COVID. So therefore, I think that we ought to just focus on something that's tangible, that's doable, make it small, make it doable, work with it long-term. And I think if enough of us do that, we'll be able to turn this problem around. Sounds good. Next person. Yes. So excellent session. Um, it was extremely inspiring to hear the synergies across the presentations. Um, there was a sense of um, relief when it is that the presentations were being um, presented to the to the, uh, the wider audience out there. The citizen security plan it provides an excellent framework um, to which we have been promoting as key stakeholders. The framework to which we all refer to in terms of how it is that we can support, that is the guiding map. And excellent programs such as Professor Hamilton's work being done by members of civil society, work by police. There is a place for everyone under this broad umbrella of the CSP. So again, it's just about coordinating efforts, um, partnership, keeping those the chains and levels of communication open, and we will make it happen. It's more of them. More of us, less of them. So we'll make it happen. Good job. Thank you. That's me next. Well, I just want to endorse one point made by Rosalie, and that is that this didn't start overnight and it won't end overnight. There's a tendency towards impatience when things get really bad and things are really bad now. And I can understand the impatience, but if we are not deliberate and intentional about what we do, we won't get very far. We'll just be throwing money around and doing things. So I want us to continue to be focused, continue to be directed by information, and continue to be deliberate about what we do. Not jumping from one thing to the next and listening to all the chatter around. But let's, let's continue to support the plan. It's a good plan. And... If we work together, that's one thing we have learned. Working apart will not achieve what we want. We have to work in a coordinated way and an integrated way. We will look at what is being done and see how we can complement the work of others to close the gaps. That's the only way I think we can succeed. So let us continue to work in the frame we have and intensify those efforts. All right. Thank you so much. Next person. Mr. Junior. Mr. Junior. I, I'm, I'm normally five feet, 10 inches after this, after this um, conversation, I'm sitting at about nine feet. Um, <laughs> uh, very, I'm very proud to have been invited and to be able to participate. Uh, Brigadier, you, um, you knocked the ball out of the park in establishing a foundation. And I was very proud to see that everyone built on that foundation and we're leaving with one united voice, which is very powerful. 
um, and w w whatever is required to do, um, I'm in and we'll get it done. There's a couple of vehicles that's out there. J JD10 is a very um, strong vehicle and the Global Jamaican Diaspora Council, another very strong vehicle. So let's all partner and um, coordinate our efforts and I'm sure that we'll, we'll get it done. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you so Thank much. Yeah, I'm completely excited, Leo, uh, this yes. evening. This yes. is the 16th day of June that's been chosen uh, for, for this um, enormous project that you've put together with, your, with the entire team around the world. And the reason I'm excited about that is that it's, it's great to have an opportunity as a part of the diaspora to give back to Jamaica because the Caribbean has given so much to us. The Caribbean has given us here um, in, in the diaspora and in the United States. They have given us uh, Marcus Garvey. And, and his organization. They've given us um, Louis Farrakhan, who is of Jamaican descent. They've given us Malcolm X, who is from of Grenadian descent. And they've given us on this particular day, one transformative figure, Stokely Carmichael, who is Trinidadian. And Stokely, of course, as you know, served as head of SNCC. But one of the things about today, this date in history, is that Stokely Carmichael transitioned SNCC from using the term justice to using, um, I mean, freedom, to using the term black power. But what's more important about Stokely Carmichael that is opportune for what we're doing here this evening is that Stokely Carmichael said this, that the time has come for us to organize the organizations. And so that's what I see, Jay Tan, ah. see, is that you're organizing the organizations. So instead of quoting uh, from Henry Ford, I'm quoting Stokely Carmichael, a fellow <laughs> in organizing the organizations. Thank you. Jamaica has a great promise and a great future ahead. When we organize the commercial in, in, um, sector, we organize the governmental sector, we organize the alumni associations, um, yes. uh, sociologists, psychiatrists, all yes. together to fight and combat crime. God bless you all. You forget Colin Powell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 rookie, take us home. Thank rookie? you, Leah. Yes. I'm here. Thank you, much appreciated. Thank you all. Like I mentioned before, the question and answer due to time, we will answer those and wrap up. Thank you all again. This was the diaspora. We have a, a call to action. There is, we hear from, we heard from Jamaica. We heard what is needed, how we can be engaged, how we can help. Now, I. I would recommend that we all go back to our different diaspora groups and work on this, work on how, work on the plans, the intervention with the people on the ground to get this done. Thank you all again for participating. Thank you to our viewers on Jamaica, jamaicans.com. Now we'll be going into our closing ceremony. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you again soon. All right. It's a great session. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so we're going to go into, we're going to roll in, instead of stop and start, we're going to roll into our, our closing session. Where's Sue and, uh, and Grethel and um, the Clarks, Adriana Clark. And if you guys want to stay with us, you can stay with us because there's going to be some serious singing going on here to close out the, 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 the evening. Um, where's Adriana? And, and, and Dr. Oh, there's Dr. We're Sue. all here, thank you very okay, much. Okay, okay. But I am not going to <laughs> no, say nothing until Sue, until Sue starts her poem or poetry. Please, Sue, start what? right now. I'm not doing any introduction, just start. Everybody wants to see it. Yes, please. Talk. I mean, Dr. Sue, oh my God, I have known her for a long time. She said, I'm right on my side, yes, sir. And she was the, di <laughs> the diaspora advisory board member for, for, for two years. And we turn up right up on her and follow her. Do. OK, there you go. Good and since introduction. I'm, since I'm parading the black, green, and gold, I'll do yes, the um, there you go. I am Jamaica bit. There you I go. I want to share there, later. There you go. There you go. I am Jamaica. I am Jamaica, my team for the clear. I am Jamaica, shout it out in the air. I am Jamaica, whether me there a yard or abroad. I am Jamaica, and they have my umbilical card. I am Jamaica, cause I choose to be. I am Jamaica, naturalized and free. I am Jamaica, <laughs> see me standing tall. I am Jamaica, it take no for me, me fall. I am Jamaica. Wait, you don't hear about me. 
I am Jamaica. I defy all possibility. I am Jamaica. When me good, me good bad. I am Jamaica. When me bad, me bad good. I am Jamaica. Me are the black, green, and gold. I am Jamaica in body, spirit, and soul. And soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, that's really good. That's really good. Uh, you know, we, we have a couple of guys who go and sing for us, but, but, but let's start with, um, um, you know, there's a young lady on, on, on here, right? Her name is Adriana Clark. Does it, does, does it ring a bell to you? Adriana mm -hmm. Clark. You know that song there? Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> was out of a direction. I didn't know which way yes, to yes. go. Yes, All right, I saw the clues to life unanswered uh, questions. Uh, 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 stop, uh, yeah, stop, uh, yeah, stop, uh, yeah, stop, <laughs> stop. Uh, yo, she, uh, she accords it. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> she is the daughter <laughs> of, stop. she's the daughter of Bonnie Ruggs. Uh, yes. The lead singer for many years, somebody that I, I really adore. I'm a loving voice like a Lisa Peace. Yes. And, um, and, 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 and she's here to represent that and represent herself. Adriana, take it away. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. That was amazing. And you, you, you did a great mimic of it. You sound good. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, I just want to take the time before I get into the song just to say thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of um, this meeting tonight, um, it was amazing to just hear the different perspectives and hear a task force coming together for the greater good of a country that we all uh, love, Jamaica. And um, one thing about my father is he loved his country. He loved Jamaica. He loved his people. He loved his music. He loved his food. He loved everything about Jamaica. And that's why he wrote this song that I'm going to sing for you. He wrote it for the... Um, for one of the Jamaica, one of our independence anniversaries. And it's called Land We Love, Sweet, oh. Sweet Jamaica. So I'm gonna sing that for us as we are um, celebrating Jamaica, as we're talking about Jamaica. And I know that we all love this country, so we can definitely all agree with the lyrics of this song. So um, here it is, uh, Land We Love, Sweet Jamaica. <laughs> um, There's a land not so far away where the sun keep shining all through the days and this land that we all love god gave us the wood and the water blessed by the moon and stars above yes sweet sweet jamaica oh it's beautiful Jamaica Every day feels like a holiday Sweet reggae music playing From Negril to Morant Bay It's sweet, sweet Jamaica Oh, it's beautiful Jamaica Cause Jamaicans, we are number one, world leaders and champions, prophets and musicians, out of many, we are one. Sweet, sweet Jamaica. Oh, I love my beautiful Jamaica. Irie, 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 Irie. Jamaica, yeah, yes. It's sweet Jamaica, our land we love. Na 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 why? I say na 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 why? Na 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 why? Oh na 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 why? I said na 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 why? Oh oh na 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 why? Oh na 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 why? It's sweet sweet. Jamaica, amen. Sweet, sweet Jamaica, a land we love. Thank you so yes. much. <laughs> hey, do you know Negril to Maran Point? Yes, yes, I do. Oh, okay, okay, because yes, you're, you're better. 
Yeah, yeah cause you can't be singing that song. You don't, you don't know. All right. he, he, he made sure he took us. He made okay, sure he took all right. Us. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thank man, you respect, so much. Respect. Stay with us. Stay with us. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, so let's go into uh, what what today sounds like. Um, what it looked like. What did it feel like? I I, I want um, you know Dr. Sue and 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 especially Grethel and and um and and rookie and adriana and andrew if you are listening to any part of this please join us t uh, tell us what it is that you you you, you felt today what, what what tell us tell us about the sessions grethel oh i thought the sessions were fantastic just from the beginning to the end and i'm going to tell you the truth but tired Oh, but you're, tired. You're, not, you're not too yeah. tired for okay. you know, the you know, want fantastic, you know, want fantastic thing. Listen, okay. listen, this right. is a quarter of nine. I am okay. tired. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead and tell us now. But it was absolutely, I mean, it was fantastic. And, you know, I tried all the way through just to kind of like see what I got from it. And I'm just taking like one, one word at a time, like one, yes. one sentence. Yes. Parents, um, parents and other able the parents. Um, other able to, um, persons yes. mm -hmm. don't give up, don't give up, right? right? There are lots of abilities, lots of strength, lots of creativity. And so we have to, as a network, tap into that, okay? Yes. Because they have the strength. That's the first one. Education, words, innovation, vision, tenacity, um, vested dedication, and true citizen rate. Is that a right word? Citizen yes. Me. That no, is no, good. Let me say it right. It, it yeah, sounds good. It sounds good. Right? It sounds good. Sound good, mm -hmm. right? It sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, leadership. Um, for the youth, I what I what stood out for me is that they see themselves as shapers of the future. Absolutely. Right. They see themselves as being able to reach, to engage. And, and, and really get to the young people so that they can preserve our planet that we are going to leave, that we've made such a mess up, okay? Um, the media, I thought what I got from them was that change is good. It's not a bad thing, right? And we can know what the changes are and move with the changes. Don't, don't get left behind. Yeah. Um, health, um, there's a lot that's been accomplished. A lot more needs to be accomplished. Get in the know. And um, because if we get in the know, then we are able to help. Um, uh, future employment with um, Cherie, um, always be forward thinking, or uh, don't stay back. Um, make sure that you are strategic, you're intentional, and that you make use of the digital space that is there, right? And I love one that Katie Francis said, she said, everybody can eat food. Right? <laughs> so that means that there's a job out there for everybody. For everybody. everybody can go out there and find what interests them, what engages them. And I think I'm going to stop right here, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'll give the rest. I I'll give the rest so soul. much about saving lives and, 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 and transforming lives and communities. And give, give, give the rest to Sue. Someone. Let me tell you why. Right, there you go. Sue, Sue, I go copy tech. Sue, Sue, I go copy tech. I'm tired too. Sue, yes, Sue, I go copy tech. Sue. Yes, sir. Please don't copy tech. It was so rich. <laughs> and like Gretel, me tired. <laughs> I learned today that I'm really able to multitask because I was working today. I mean, yes. work, my job work today. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. I was still really? engaged and plugged into this all day since nine o'clock this morning. Jesus. So I, 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 you know, I had to pat myself on the shoulder That's because right. I was able to maintain both, but this was rich. Yeah. And I was saying to myself earlier, as I was tying my head, <laughs> that had this been on the ground, I would not have absorbed so much, so much. as I did today. I would not have been able to attend all the different because number one, you're going to have concurrent session exactly. and you're going to have double session. You have lunch. You have, so you're uh, going to miss water. something. <laughs> but because it's here, I, I was yeah. able to take in everything. I, did, I, was, I didn't miss anything. So that was good. And, you know, at first I thought, oh my God, from 10 to 10, how is that going to do? But it, it I was 
what, 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 what's the word? <laughs> I was captivated. I was, it, it, it was so engaging. I mean, one after the other, the information was fresh. It was new. It was honest. It was real. It was, it, it was what I needed. And, you know, I just feel that I'm sorry for the persons <laughs> who missed out on this. <laughs> oh my God. Thank because you so much. Especially those who are asking about what is being done. And in the opening this morning, Leo, you spoke about the first 10 years of the um, diaspora um, movement, movement, advisory board movement, and how hard it was and nothing was happening. But it's like the bamboo tree, you know? Um, it stays underground for years before it come up. and getting itself together. It was the foundation. We were putting things together and look how we blossom in now. Look at what's yes. happening. Those naysayers that were kept saying that we were empty vessels and yes. that nothing was happening and we just all talk. Where yes. are they now? You know, yes. what are they saying? Are they really seeing that things are coming yes. to fruition? <laughs> and that it took um, time, it took, oh, energy. I, I, I lived it for two and a half years. I know <laughs> what it yeah. took to get us to this place today, but I'm, I'm happy, I'm pleased. Um, you know, unlike Gretel that was able, because I was actually working, like I said. But you're I, doing great, you know, let me tell you something. You're sending, you're sending, you're sending, you're sending, you're sending, you're sending, you're sending ice through my vein, you know? <laughs> It's true. Uh, I mean, that's how I, I felt this morning when I was talking. I, I said, where are those guys now? They're not writing talk shop anymore. They're mm -hmm. actually coming to us for information now. Right. right? <laughs> so well, I am I'm I'm very happy. You know, that was able to um, write down things from everybody that was talking and verbatim. Yeah. And yeah. So <laughs> I wasn't able to do that because I was otherwise engaged as well. But I, ha I had to put a piece together on yeah. what how today felt for well, me. Well, we, we're going, we're going to get to that right now. We're going to get to that right now. I won't we, share. We want it. You can't write it for the show and then don't give it to us. That don't make any sense. I can give it to you and you can so, post it with all the other notes. That so we you can't say it? <laughs> all right. All right. So I'm um, literally coming back to singing us. So, you know, she go give us one more. Right, Adriana, before... Um, all right, make sure you sing. When you finish, sing. All right, all right, all right. Where, where's Andrew? Andrew, are you there? Come on, cameraman. Andrew, come, come on. Sing us for, sing, come sing out for us, Andrew. Buss out. I, what do you look like American? Andrew, good evening. Like uh, Andrew. Good evening, everybody, good evening. Good oh, okay, evening. there you go. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's hearty. Uh, Very hearty. You sound like American. Hearty. You sound like American. <laughs> We gotta switch it up, you know. Yes, we very well. Throw a little accent every now and then, you know. Yes, <laughs> accent. The accent sound like accent. <laughs> oh, good. All right. So I, I, I was thinking really hard about what song would be appropriate to celebrate right. um, this wonderful day of activities. Um, so uh oh, Andrew, your audio. We're hearing him. We're hearing him very well. We're hearing him very well. Must be okay, good. Time. Thank you. Want to hear me good? Very yes. good. Okay. Good, good, good. Fantastic. So let me jump on into this song. These are, uh, you, might record, you might recognize both of them. All right. This time, boy, I may never see you. <laughs> <laughs> Jamaica land of beauty, we promise faithfully. To serve thee with our talents and bring our gifts to thee. Jamaica, we will always in honor of thy name. Work steadfastly and wisely and never bring the shame from riverside to mountain from cane field to the sea we are proud jamaicans and our past we can't forget 
For the power which we wrought our fathers do live strong within us yet. We are proud Jamaicans and our past we can't forget. For the power which we wrought our fathers do live strong within us yet. Today in sweet Jamaica, a joyful song we raise. We count our many blessings, we lift our voice in praise. For God has brought us thus far, and he still holds our hand. To bring us to a brighter day in this our native land, we are proud Jamaicans. And our past we can't forget. For the power which brought our fathers to live strong within us yet. We are proud Jamaicans. And our past we can't forget. For the power which brought our fathers to live strong within us yet. The struggle is not ended. Full freedom we must find. For though they freed the body, only we can free the mind. The game is not yet over. We've merely won the toss. There are more mountains we must climb and many rivers to cross. But we will cross. Yes, we will cross. For we are proud Jamaicans, and our past we can't forget. For the power which brought our fathers through lives strong within us yet. We are proud Jamaicans, and our past we can't forget. For the power which brought our fathers through lives strong within us yet. Our hearts salute Jamaica. Triumphant, proud and free. Son, your name Clark too. Uh, uh, hey. I'm the I'm I'm the Clark. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, is that embossed it up? <laughs> that was you, good. Man. That was you. beautiful. That really, listen, I have not Thank heard you. that song since I was a little kid. I'm yes, exactly. You know, that that, was, that, song that song is beauty. one of the oh my god songs. <laughs> That's a yes. really you make it Absolutely. sound so good and natural and sweet. Oh my god! Because say, because our our songs, the songs from our culture are to, are to be revered and celebrated. Absolutely. Often time we sing them. It's a young Leo. Leo, if yes, somebody so young can sing it so yes. good so that you can remember it. Ah, true, a true. Yeah, man, me applaud people like Andrew. You see, a true, we can't sing it, you know. But <laughs> Donna, the funny line, you know, Donna is on the line. So Donna, before yes. Adrian comes back, um, tell us what you you gleaned today from the session. Well, like Gretel said, first of all, I'm tired, <laughs> right? I've been at this very seat from 9.30 this morning, so. <clears throat> no, from nine, because when we come at nine o'clock, it was on. Yes, true, <laughs> I'm nine, nine o'clock, so, and I, you know, the hair is still, everything's still perfect, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, we had a wonderful time. Um, it was definitely a, an experience. My job was busy sharing it out on social media all over the place, all the different pages, and everybody was then sharing it. So people didn't even realize, they're like, oh my God, the connection, they loved it. So I'm glad to be a part of this and you guys make it COVID you know, lifestyle <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> um, I'm proud of our task force and I'm, I'm proud that we are an action. That's a big difference. Big we difference. Do work. We don't just talk. We do the we do the walk too. So, yeah. I'm just glad to be a part of it. But yes, I'm tired and ready for my glass of wine. Uh, 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 
Ahem, ahem, ahem. <laughs> I didn't want to drink, you know, because if I drink anything, then maybe I would have take somebody off or send, you know. Uh, Adriana, Adriana, are you there? Come save her for me, please. Adriana, <laughs> I don't want anybody to get drunk on this show. Right. Adriana, where are you? to try to take you off, Leo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. It looked like Adriana's sleeping. Is Adriana sleeping? You're hugging that dog too. That's it. No, no she's me sleep no no oh. <laughs> i'm awake are you Andrew, what an awesome voice you have what a nice voice thank you, you thank have. You. yes well, we, i was we, blown we, away we love your voice too adrian we want another sound That's from you man boss it up to boss it up to Leo, right. you know uh, adriana has a radio show um also what are your times adriana Oh, yes. Um, so I'm on Caribbean Rhythms Radio Network every Sunday from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then I also have my show on Happy Hour from Wednesdays um, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. So you can always log on to CRRFM.com um, or we also have a Facebook. I shared this, um, this meeting on our Facebook as well, so you can find us there. Okay. Great, 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 great. All right. <laughs> All right. So what's up now? All right. Um, this song I will sing. This song uh, came to me. Um, just as we were we were talking about the the this Zoom meeting, and it just reminded me that everyone is so in their place, and everyone's coming together, and everyone knows, um, you know what they need to do and how we need to get things got done. And it kind of just reminded me of this gospel song, um, by Sanak. I'm sure many of you know. Um, it goes, "We are a chosen gener." Ration. We're called for to show his excellence. All I require for life, God has given me, and I know who I am. We are a chosen generation, and we're called for to show his excellence. All I require for life, God has given me. And I know who I am. I know who God says I am, what he says I am, and where he says I'm at. I know who I am. I know who God says I am, and what he says I am, and where he says I'm at. I know who I am. I'm walking in power. I'm walking in miracles. I live a life of favor, because I know who I am. I'm walking in power, and I'm walking in miracles. I live a life of favor, cause I know who I am. Take a look at me, I'm a wonder. Hey, it doesn't matter what you see now. Can you see his glory? Cause I know who I am. Take a look at me, I'm a wonder. It doesn't matter what you see now. Can you see his glory? Cause I know who I am. <laughs> yeah! Amen. <laughs> Thank you.